Welcome to the Gagaris Mammal Podcast. I am Chris, and over to my right is... Kate Lawrence. Hello, everybody. And we are joined for an interview show today by Jessica Lovegood, up north in sunny England, or south, depending on your perspective of the globe, I guess. How... Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, it is England. So how are you there in post... Chaos Britain. <laughs> yes, um, very much ignoring it and getting on with my own things and looking forward to moving out of the country, I'm afraid. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, yes, you're moving to Amsterdam in a couple I of weeks. I am moving to Amsterdam, yeah. yeah. Excellent, excellent. But before we get too much into your life, maybe you should explain who you are, um, what you do, and then we'll get to uh, why we asked you on the show. Cool. So um, I am officially a user experience consultant. That's my official title. Uh, but I do lots of things. So um, I can uh, build websites and um, code lots of other weird things that I've just tried out in the past. And uh, I do WordPress sites a lot, build sites for clients, do logos for clients. But my my sort of passion is the UX side of it, which is why people do what they do and um, how, to, how to influence that so that um, people can have a good experience and also businesses can be successful at the same time so it's kind of merging those two things and that's where my sort of passion lies sure and are you currently working for yourself or working for a company and what's what's awaiting you in amsterdam yeah so at the moment i am working uh, for myself just between the sort of two jobs i had um so just doing a few things um building like uh, designing rather some apps uh, and building some client websites uh but in amsterdam i'll be at booking.com oh, so of course, uh, of, course. <laughs> yeah, of course it's amsterdam right <laughs> uh yes yeah, so i've got that waiting for me that's a ux designer specific job so uh, that should be really good it, I have been to that office for a party um, <laughs> Amazing. and it's very near the beautiful Pathé Theatre oh. yes it's it's beautiful around there I can't wait to uh, walk to work as well which is very odd I live in Milton Keynes and we're full of roundabouts and I have to drive everywhere so. I <laughs> do remember Milton Keynes with uh, not a lot of fondness <laughs> <laughs> well in Amsterdam you can look forward to bike roundabouts absolutely yeah <laughs> oh yes the um, great crush of bikes every morning that they've actually got to the point they um have had trialing a number of traffic lights for bikes Brilliant. which basically um they it's almost like a speed camera and they use it connected to the um traffic lights to determine what speed you need to be what speed you're you're riding at and is your speed enough to be able to get to the next traffic light um <laughs> while it's while it's amber i guess as wow. opposed to I, I was actually talking to some some guys uh, yesterday about traffic lights but we're getting a bit off topic mm. here this is a whole other <laughs> Our, 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 the, the catchphrase for our podcast is that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Um, so, so let's let's get started. So basically, I encountered you through the Manning um, publisher. Uh, I think I've mentioned it a couple of times on the show. I'm doing a, a video course for their fledgling um, uh, tutorial platform. Currently working on that. Uh, and and what, what's your experience with what's your work with Manning involved? So I designed that platform. Ah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple. And a couple of so other I know things. Who so. To blame. <laughs> yeah, so I uh, I designed live book as well, which is coming out soon. Um, but yeah, essentially I'm their designer at the moment. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. I, I saw a very, very early preview of it, but it's actually some really cool stuff, um, which maybe we won't go into detail because I'm not 100% sure if we're allowed to. So we'll just leave it there. Mm-hmm. But, it's actually <laughs> launched now. It's called Live oh, Video if anyone wants to check Excellent. it out. Okay. So. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'll probably talk about that more in the future when I've done a bit more work. Anyway, so I encountered you there and you posted a link uh, or you were working on a survey and then you uh, posted a follow up link to it called um, or about how techies and creatives learn best. And education is something that is uh, a topic is a topic that both Kate and I are quite passionate about in different ways. We've both done workshops, we've both done teaching. Kate's worked in the education sector from a different aspect. Um, we both do article writing, documentation work, trying to help people learn things like that. I think that's a fair a fair thing to say, Kate. Something mm. we're both really interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, yeah, so I couldn't help but be interested in. Um, in this survey you were doing and um, yeah, maybe you'd like to talk about why you did it uh, and then um, yeah, let's talk about why you did it first and then we'll get into what you learnt in a cool. minute So uh, I guess I'm the same as you guys I've worked in uh, higher education a lot 
uh, and my both my wife and my dad are both teachers um, and it's something that uh, as a kid I suppose I wasn't really very into so I was into the learning but I wasn't into the education part of it it didn't it didn't fit with me I didn't like it I was very naughty and uh, whilst I was really clever um, I didn't need to kind of commit to all the rules and you know all that kind of thing I was a bit of a rebel so um, I've, I've kind of followed education accidentally just for the jobs I've had but to me it's part of how um, we sort of move society forward and and you'll see in a lot of my stuff I feel quite epically about user experience and using it um, in life so um, part of this was because I believe in that uh, and part of it was because I'm gonna I'm going to essentially launch a learning platform that's going to do web things a bit differently and make it a bit more accessible to people. So, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a mess at the minute. So I kept reading things like if you want to get into front end development, you need to quit everything and do it full time. And, um, you know, there's uh, loads of random job titles that don't make any sense to anyone. It's like such an inaccessible, um, uh, I don't, it's, it's creatives and it's um technology but technology more so learning to code is really hard and learning about websites is really difficult for ordinary people so for example um i have clients who go on godaddy because they watch the advert and it's one pound a month and i i struggle to explain to them um like how how that is not okay and you should be spending 20 pounds you know <laughs> like what, what the difference is in the service so i've been working uh, almost accidentally trying to help people learn from either from like starting to code or starting to design or lay people so that's where i'm kind of focused so what i wanted to know was how do people who are already there feel more comfortable like what's their preferred go-to because then at least then i'll know what people aiming to get there will will need so that was my motivation. Hmm. Sounds like a very good purpose for um, initiating the project. Yeah. And absolutely. how did you get the, um, the, I guess, the subjects that you, um, that, that, you know, filled out the survey? Was it just an open call out or did you use social media or uh, other means? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was small. Like I'd love to do it again and do it more specific. Um, it was because it was just like a canvas, but um, so we've got, I use the Manning authors. We have a Slack group uh, and the main Manning group. So that, that kind of covered the um, learning devs and current devs who are still learning kind of thing. Um, and then I'm in a user experience group. So I got all my UXs and researchers and designers and stuff from there. Um, and then I put it out on social media. So I got a few others and a, and a couple of um, sort of more niche areas um, and then writers as well because I'm in a writer's group. So I just kind of canvassed the groups I was in. So just to, before we get to the, the kind of the results and the, mm. the things from that, let's just actually talk a little bit more about the, the purpose of this. So I can now see in the article the for the Better Web Project. So yeah. you sort of touched very briefly on, on that, but maybe tell us a little bit more detail what you intend that to be. Yeah, so I mean, I'm being purposefully cryptic, right? Because okay. <laughs> because I've not released it yet. That's um, fair enough. But it's it's just going to be a learning platform. It's the it's more about the ethos and the uh, methods behind it. So I suppose one of the one of the biggest things that I want to focus on is getting people into tech that aren't already there, or making people feel comfortable with tech when they actually feel quite afraid. Um, and there's been a lot of things in my sort of career where I've had newbies with me or people that don't understand and I've explained things to them and they've gone oh I get it so things like hosting for example um, that could be really hard to explain to a client why they need to pay for both a regular payment and a domain and or oh, I thought I already had my website and do I need that builder that could be a really complicated conversation so I come up with an analogy for example for that so I have this filing cabinet analogy where you rent a drawer of a filing cabinet from the people providing you with your hosting um, and then you put all your website files in that filing cabinet and then you put a label on the front of that filing cabinet which tells people which one's yours so your domain is your label and your files is your website and your your server and your hosting is that drawer for you and you rent that off someone so that explanation just literally people go yep cool no worries <laughs> you know and it's things like that I've, I've I've got a whole notebook full of these little analogies and uh, little drawings and stuff like that. And it's just tapping into that really simple version. 
to to help people actually learn this at the start because it's so difficult to get into unless you've been around it. So, for example, loads of um, loads of devs I know kind of started with uh, in the 80s with loads of old school computers and you had to code it yourself then. And so they know things like that as a base. And I mean, even I don't. I've, I've kind of done things in an odd way. So um, if I code now, I know how to do websites, but I don't know how computer works in detail because I never I'm not quite old enough to have experienced that whole playing around poking things and I never had anything like that at home so I'm having to go back now I've got a little Arduino kit and stuff like that, you know <laughs> yeah. uh, but, it, but it's taking a lot of time and I'd like to take people on a on a uh, on a path really so that's the idea of the better web it's a it's a it's a proper stepping stone with proper paths that teach you everything to do with creative stuff and technology I mean, this is actually so I've had two very momentous kind of learning and uh, actually teaching experiences. Mm. One more recently, one quite a while ago, uh, always teaching to beginners. One was um, funder, like absolute basics of computers to a room full of this was a little while ago when um, I don't think even smartphones were not, I can't actually remember if they were even available, but they certainly weren't wide, widespread yet. Um, and Teaching people how to use a computer who've never touched one was actually a really eye-opening experience. And mm-hmm. I studied the some aspects of the precursor to UX HCI, Human Computer Interaction at University, yeah. which dates when I went to university. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and a lot of the kind of practices and processes you pick up there, you can throw a lot of them out the window when you mm-hmm. meet a room full of complete beginners. And I found that really fascinating. Um, and then fast forward, I think I actually can't even remember if it was last summer or the summer before, but we had some coding classes here in Berlin for the Syrian refugees. So that was also a very different experience. I mean, mm-hmm. people knew how to use a computer, but they knew how to use a computer for internet and, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Coding is a whole different um, challenge. And we learned quite a lot there about good ways to teach concepts that do and don't make sense and things like that but so the aspect of what you just said i actually wanted to go into a bit more detail because it's something that has struck me has changed is this discussion on analogies and especially because you just mentioned the whole one of the filing cabinet and it's one i've used a little bit in the past but from uh, yeah i've actually used the files in folders and folders in the filing cabinet and etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's interesting you took it further but of course there's a lot of these analogies now that won't make sense to people mm. uh, like the floppy disk to save the the filing cabinet like mm. i would say a lot of people under a certain age don't know what these things are yeah so absolutely. Is, is there a time you've encountered this when analogies just don't work anymore and they need updating yeah, absolutely. So um, I've accidentally mentored a, a young lady at my uh, sort of contract that I had before at Cranfield University. And so she was doing web admin stuff, so CMS stuff. So, you know, visually seeing things and typing words in and pressing buttons, right? But she was actually quite um, savvy with the tech. So if, she, if something was going wrong, she could figure it out and stuff like that. So I kind of took her under my wing a bit and uh, taught her some things. Um, and that analogy actually didn't fit with her. And I don't know if, if it was because she was younger. So she was, she was about 22 um but it didn't quite fit so actually what i did was i drew instead and really simple um boxes and lines and building up a picture with drawing so obviously my sort of design background helps a lot here um that method worked really well as well so i've I've definitely swapped it up before because sometimes people can't imagine things either so um quite a lot of people have trouble holding that sort of uh, thought in the head and imagining a thing that you're telling them um so seeing it drawn on paper and not having to also remember it and picture it at the same time as you're learning it can be an even simpler way uh, yeah and that i had to switch that up completely because she didn't get it but i mean it was a similar it's the same premise so um i drew sort of a box that would have been in the story the filing cabinet drawer um and then i put a, a sort of label on the front of it i labeled the front of the box you know so it's the same kind of thing but just just a, re- a much simpler version that they didn't have to think too much about because it was in front of them do you have anything to just add to this little bit of the conversation kate no, I think we can move on to the next question. Okay. I just wondered if you had any experiences. I mean, when you used to do workshops, they were very physical workshops, so less conceptual stuff, I suppose. Yeah. So it's easier to demonstrate, maybe. Mm, yes and no. Um, I think... <sighs> yeah, I mean, I did... 
I've done a variety of different teaching roles. So, you know, I think when you teach cooking, it is very hands-on. So it's about doing and learning by using your hands as a very physical process. And even just doing that, you learn how many people can't really struggle to read a recipe. It's like yeah. they, see, they see the name of the recipe, they see the ingredients, and they see that there's a you know a certain number of steps they have to do and they panic. It's like, and you go, okay, let's just take this back. Let's see, okay, what have we got here? We've got an onion. We've got a capsicum. We've got, you know, a tomato, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, what does number one say? Number one says you, you know, cut, chop the onion. Okay, so you need to get a board and a knife. So if you go get the board and knife, like you literally have to break it down yeah. that specific for some people. Yeah. Um, and I think part of it is because of that kind of fear, fear of failure. And I think this is a big thing when someone's learning something new at an older age. Um, I often worked with a lot of older people cook, learning cooking, like preserving in particular. I did a lot of preserving classes. And there are often people where the, the idea of preserving skipped a culture. Because, uh, sorry, skipped a generation rather. Because, you know, older people used to do it. Then sort of the next generation, their parents went to work. So they weren't needing to preserve food. You know, they had refrigerators and access to shops, all that stuff. So the younger people were kind of like, ah, hang on, I want to do this. And, you know, they had to learn it. And so it was a very different experience for them. This is actually a very perfect segue into the next set of questions. Yeah. But it's also an even more perfect segue for a very quick plug. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, if you are in Berlin or indeed in a similar time zone, because we're going to actually live stream it at the Write the Docs, which is a community for kind of technical communicators uh, meet up in Berlin, we have a talk entitled "What you, What Your User Guide Can Learn from a Chocolate Cake Recipe." So, oh. <laughs> so it's an almost perfect plug. So That's I had to great. get that in. <laughs> so, so have a look at that on meetup.com. But um, actually. The better transaction, but I couldn't. I couldn't uh, transition, but I couldn't resist that quick plug. Was now into the actual demographic of the survey, the, your methodology. So, I mean, I, I could read it out, but I'll let I'll let you. the The question you asked and the available answers for this survey. Yeah. So essentially, I just asked how people like to learn because. So the, <laughs> I could have asked. Um, so yeah, we could have asked how what their learning style is, and I tried to avoid doing that. So I've been reading quite a lot before I did this about um, learning styles in general, and because especially because I've never felt I fitted into that, um, I feel that asking those questions like "Are you a this type of learner?" don't really work. Um, so the the it was purposefully written so that it was how do you enjoy? And because I know that when people are enjoying themselves and, and you're exactly right, that fear of failure means you're not enjoying yourself, right? It's very hard to take stuff in and learn. So if you're, if you're happy and enjoying it, it just goes in, just stays. So you're like, yeah, that's a happy memory. I'm going to keep that one, you know, and your brain just does it for you. So it was purposely written so that it was um, pick the top ways you prefer to learn. So that's the, that's the wording of it. Um, and yeah, it was, it was available to everyone who, who wanted to fill it in really. Um yeah, and then I gave uh, examples rather than types. So the the answers were on the job, uh, watching videos and doing practice, watching videos and doing nothing, uh, reading blogs or books, talking to people, teaching people, um, sketches, analogies and other. So I just left an other open to see if people added stuff in. Um, and there were some more traditional things in there, like I like to go to uni or you know <laughs> things like that. Um, so, you know, traditional, like I like to actually go to a class or watch a webinar. And stuff like that. But it was all sort of within the same category. So some practical some less practical some video some uh reading some talking you know it's all that kind of stuff so let's get a little bit deeper into the results then um um so yeah tell us firstly the kind of the the main group of respondents you've got they were sort of overrepresented i think but you had a fairly mixed pie of, yes. <laughs> uh, of respondents. So what sort of response did you get? Yeah, so it was, it was quite mixed. Um, and I sort of ended up grouping people together because it was a small survey. So there was, I think there was 60 people that um, contributed. So if I'd have done um, a bit on the front end devs, I'd have probably only ended up with five people and that's not really quite representative. So I sort of divvied it up into uh, part design and part 
uh, part development for the for the sort of analysis bit. Um, most of the people I've got were user experience designers just because I'm quite a big part of that group and talk a lot in it. And I think people want to help me out. <laughs> um, also, it's like it was a really mixed bag of how people work as well. So um, and a lot of people have multiples, which I was um, quite fascinated about. So um, somebody had put my own business, small business and for myself because they're kind of doing all the same things at once. And uh, so that was quite interesting. Um, results out of that were so I, I, I did the devs. Do you want me to talk about only the devs or all? Because I can talk about both. I, I think let's this is the, the audience of this podcast is fairly broad. Um, yeah. So let, let's talk about all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, why cool. not? So in general, um, learning by doing was top. No questions. It, it absolutely was top. Nearly every person put it down. I think it was something like 56 out of 60 or something. You know, it was everybody. So that practical element that you were kind of talking about earlier absolutely is key for any of this stuff. Um, and I think, I think the cooking thing um, actually is is in that category as well <laughs> it's kind of creative right um so that i mean all those things people definitely need to do it and that and that is i mean I'm, i imagine that's part of memory um and plus once you've done it then of course you're happy you've done it and especially with coding i mean you can with with coding and designing actually and website conversions seo everything they they never stop so you can never feel happy that you've finished <laughs> that you've ticked a box and you've got your certificate and that's it you constantly have to learn so so this learning by doing makes sense to me because i'm like okay so you feel happy every time you learn a new thing and do a new thing you put it into practice you know you've got it that makes you happy you know there's kind of no stopping point so um that was like the biggest one the next two were uh books and blogs and talking to others so so reading stuff but I, I would be interested in the future to know if that wasn't just bias from I've done these things before. I, just I actually, a qu- oh, sorry, you go, you go first, Kate. Just a question now. When 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 you mentioned blogs, for example, I mean, I notice when I look at um, lots of different, I don't know, learning materials on blogs, they use screenshots quite a bit, which is something I've always found very useful personally. Yeah, or or uh, demos. So there's some really good things on um, how to use Sketch, for example, where people just make little gifts in between. So you could be learning how to design a particular icon, for example, and it will give you a little gift of the next step. And so you can see them doing it, then go and do it yourself. And actually, that's a mixture. So that's not it's actually not just one thing. You're actually probably learning by doing at the end of reading that blog and at the end of watching that video (laughs) so that's actually a mixture of the things and that works really well because then people can um, pick what they're most comfortable with at the point where they're ready to do it as well so could i propose a slightly um negative angle on these results in Mm -hmm. that is could it be that the reason on the job learning as you do is one of the highest is you had a lot of people who aren't given the opportunity to learn. That's what I was um, yeah. You could, you know, and also if we look at the next couple, they're the kind of easier options. They're, you know, if you don't have any kind of formal education budget or allocation at work, it's the next easy thing to do. I mean, yeah, and that happens yeah. a lot. I mean, yeah. a lot of the people were here because they're people I knew and stuff. So in the UK, I know that's it's actually really rare for someone, a company to support you in that manner. Um, and so unless you're sort of fresh out, then then you are learning by doing, um, you're using your spare time, you're practicing on the weekend, you know, all of those things. So yeah, absolutely. There's definitely an element of that, I think, and an element of um, some of, so like we talked about analogies and because we've done a lot of uh, teaching before, we've probably used that and probably sketched that. But whether a lot of people have actually absorbed that is a different matter. Right. So the the sketches and the analogies were really low. Um, but I, I don't know if that's because people have actually never experienced it. No one's taught them that way. So traditional education got lots of tick box tick boxes. Uh, but actually, I'd quite like to take this like another step further and, and try it with people. So take, you know, take 20 people in a, in a room, do various techniques, which bit of, you know, which bit helped you the most, that kind of thing. Um, one thing I did find really interesting was that the trial and error was really low. And I don't know if that's people not wanting to say they trial and error. But come on, every coder and every designer trials and error stuff. Or, or could it be that maybe 
some people interpret that as kind of the same as on the job, maybe. I'm not Possibly, sure. Yeah. yeah. Mm, but you yeah. could tick multiple boxes, so if they thought it was both, yeah. they could have ticked, ticked I, both. So. I'm also quite interested by the I like it when people sketch it out for me because I think yeah. this is this is definitely a um, – so it's also quite a low result. I think yes. because in certain sectors, like especially UX and design people, they love to sketch. Yeah. And I get it. I perfectly understand it. But as someone, I, I suppose, like a, I'm a writer with a developer background, Yeah. I actually – don't always find sketches very useful and I kind of I tend to find they're, they're for me they're slow like by the time they've sketched it out I've like I got it two minutes ago yeah um, so it could be a, 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 that I think that's a very differentiating point between mm. what you're trying to learn as well maybe and I wonder I know, what stage you're at as well because if you so I mean the reason that's in there is because when I try it out on anyone who's a non-techie and I explain something technical it works that every time I've never had it fail. So um, the reason that's there is that, but of course my audience is people who are already there, right? So because you've got base knowledge, so in that example, you've already got your base knowledge, yeah, so you're sure. already connecting yeah. the dots. And so by the time they've got through the, you know, half that drawing, you're like, no, no, no I'm fine now. <laughs> I, I've done the rest of the putting together myself. So I like, I like this thought of saying connecting the dots anyway, because that ties in conceptually to the drawing as well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting point too, because I know for me, like when I have to, as someone who's, has no training beyond, you know, a, a, a one, you know, a couple of hour courses here and there on on coding or anything on the back end of a, a computer. Um, I have to approach it in a very different way to someone who is has those skills. For example, you know, my, my first question is usually about use cases. So, what does it do? And and um, you know, what's the benefit to it? And then yeah, I kind of work backwards mm -hmm. because I'm looking at it from a very different angle from what someone is who understands the language, understands the the discourse, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think jargon's a big part of that as well. So um, people who know things already can throw words around mm. um, and build pictures in their heads, yeah. whereas yeah, um, someone with a little bit lesser or less official skills. So I'm the same as well. No official training in this, just been doing it for a hell of a long time and mm -hmm. learn constantly. Um, so when you've, when you've not got all those... Um, uh, somebody I used to work with used to call it the mental map and this lady's yep. a genius yep. she's amazing yeah so, mental mapping yeah um if you don't have the ability to put that map together yourself somebody has to put it together for you and so the the drawing thing for me and the analogies fill in that map with things you already know whereas you don't already know the jargon and the um what what things mean really yeah. because yeah. you don't have that base understanding yet uh, and that's why I think it fills in the gaps Absolutely. And I think as well, like, um, for understanding complex topics that you may be new to, like, I know when I first came across the Brockton uh, videos, it's very helpful, cartoon videos, where they actually broke it down into, you know, people, little people with their little wallets and things yeah. like that. <laughs> but, I mean, this is, so this is an interesting one, actually, quickly looking yeah. back at the results. So watching videos, tutorials, and putting them into practice yourself is quite mm -hmm. high. Yes. Watching videos only is quite low. Yes. But when it comes to the kind of conceptual videos like you're talking about there's not really anything to put into practice no. you're just picking up a concept no. so it's kind of interesting that, but then yeah. i'm going to do something with it like it yeah. may be usually if it's for an article for example then i have to be able to understand it enough that i can write about it or i can yeah, I write about someone's analysis of it or yeah. Yeah. you know something like that yeah mm. it's a different okay. kind of practice definitely yeah, yeah. 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 um but yeah, I think it. I think it um, supports that kind of learning by doing as well, because you have learnt it, and then you are learning by doing because you're putting into practice what you think you've learnt, um, and then generally along the way you'll find things that quite don't or or you don't understand quite yet, and you carry on filling those gaps. So, I mean, it's more fluid than, of course, um, we can we can assess in a survey, but. Um, a lot of these popular things combined seem to be seem to be good. Mm. Were there any surprises from the results for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, so from, I mean, there was a lot of uh, quashing stereotypes, which I thought was fun. So, um, for example, the designers didn't like the sketches at all. Like nobody voted for it. So, I mean, again, this could be that they've never had it done to them before, because generally when you're learning design, you're not 
you're not quite learning like that you're generally learning theory and um as a as a part designer part dev i like to sketch out cody things or you know things that i need to understand the the sort of base of so um i don't know if that was that um and then for the devs um they actually really like talking to people and teaching people and i and the stereotype is you know crazy devs sit in a dark corner kind of thing and yeah, it's just right. so not that yeah um, they want to talk to people and teach other people you know be a mentor like that kind of thing and, I, and a lot of the um people i spoke to afterwards were saying it was really nice that they were kind of represented in that way as these more um more sociable devs i suppose Actually, well, this is this is kind of what I wanted to come to next: the the, the job title yeah. um, breakdown. So the three main categories were designers, developers, writers, and some others. Yeah. <laughs> so anything here in these results? I mean, I can see quite a lot of uh, uh, hills and troughs here. Anything in these results that really surprised you or didn't surprise you? Yeah, I mean, uh, just those two really. I mean, the the writers were quite interesting because they they definitely didn't like video absolutely didn't like video didn't like analogies either which i thought but then if you think about the person who yeah it's odd because they're that kind of person but um it's not odd from the point of what they need to um perfect so yeah so many writers have um you know ideas in their heads and the ability to imagine and all those kind of things all built in the thing that they perfect is um grammar and spelling and um structuring what's going on in their head at the minute so you know they might have this genius idea but they don't know how to plot yet and things like that so um videos won't help you with that what will help you with that is um talking to people about what they've done reading short blogs on on processes and then trying it (laughs) and that kind of it it was definitely reflected in that because so they loved on the job reading blogs and talking to others that was top and then the only other three things they liked was trial and error because of course when you write you do right you do something you show someone you see what works Uh, yeah and and even when you finish a book i imagine it's never finished (laughs) and and that's the thing when you work as a writer like myself um it's it's like i said to someone the other day it's like being at school because you always have something due (laughs) yeah yeah it never stops having deadlines and and new projects and so and you know that can be a good thing and a bad thing (laughs) so so here's a couple that jump out at me um so designers developers and writers so trial and error by far overpopulated by writers, <laughs> yeah, <of laughs> which course. is interesting. I mean, I guess if you, you're, you're correct when it comes to grammar and things like that, you just kind of have to put it in. Um, there's no amount of posts you can read that will match exactly your your context and your sentence at the time. So I guess sometimes you just have to plug it in and see. Um, interestingly, going back to what you just said, Kate, uh, watching videos and um, just remembering what you've learnt is... is um, hardly any writers do, mm. so you're, you're quite unique there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put it into practice. Yeah, I know. That's the difference. Um, and then also, what's the? There's another. Writers obviously like reading. That seems is reasonable. Yeah, um, and also <laughs> like talking to others far more. <laughs> Um, and writers actually no again in the videos writers do not like videos no, in, in not neither talk. video category it depends what you mean by learning like are well, you learning yeah, how to be a writer, writer as well, of course, I or are you learning yeah. subjects to write about exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's very exactly. different it's always the problem with surveys of course oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> context <laughs> yeah but um, yeah I mean it is not I, I suppose most of it is sort of is sort of reasonable and it matches the, the job type etc et and um I'm just wondering how this will um, impact on your sort of your next project. Yeah, so my sort of next step is I need to finish planning the curriculum because <laughs> I need to do that. Yeah, first. there is that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I need to actually do it. Uh, but no, the, I want to. I want to then go back and um, do some practical research on. Um, so I, I want to actually do this to people who don't have it yet. So my focus in this is not actually these people. This was just to see how people got to where they are. So these the people in this survey are actually probably already uh, relatively successful. They're already doing it. They're happy with how they learn. And that's why I picked them to see, see, to see how they got there. So now what I want to do is go back to the people who want to learn it and trial some workshops and see what works in the workshops. So um, that, that's probably the next bit because then I'll see actually how my audience is learning and whether it matches up. And so then I can and start um, sort of uh, putting in the detail of the curriculum about what I will put in the videos and stuff like that. Fantastic. And I like I like the final line of the the article. Stereotypes aren't everything, which yeah. is 
you know, we all love a good stereotype. But uh, yeah. actually, and actually, I would actually, uh, I think I find it interesting what you said about there's this stereotype, especially about developers. Mm. And whilst you do meet a lot of developers like that, and I would yeah. argue that a lot of them are the ones who've been doing it a lot longer. Mm-hmm. The kind of the much the younger generation tend to be a lot more open to collaboration, to experience, uh, mm-hmm. learning experiences, to to talking, to... Yeah, they seem to be a lot more open, generally, yeah, than the older ones, actually. I mean, there's there's huge benefits to that. I mean, if, you, if you're not like that, you don't get to do hacks, you don't get to do peer programming, you might not interview as well. It's it's one of those things that people have actually been talking about for a while that developers should work on, you know, their sort of show, social side of it and their marketing side of their stuff. Um, and actually, I think, it, I think you're right. I think it's coming up now. It's on its way. I think it's becoming an inevitability, particularly in the startup scene as well, because I meet a lot of people that are the founders of startups and you can really tell the difference when you're talking to a founder who's got a dev background compared to someone who's got a management background. Very, very different and, you know... You, you sometimes do find people trying to do everything <laughs> when yeah. you know they're, they're they're really they're really core skills maybe in a different part of um, you know their startup. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So let's 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 wrap up with a little bit of um, discussion about some of the other things you do. Um, sort of some things jumped out as me as being quite interesting. I mean, yeah. firstly. How do you find uh, how, well? How's Milton Keynes? Like for anyone who who, who don't know, Milton Keynes is one of the kind of the, the the great British experiments in sort of new cities on the outskirts of London. Um, does it have a, a scene of its own, or or is it too much in the shadow of London? Oh no, it absolutely has a scene of its own. Yeah, I mean, it's only half an hour away, but. I don't know many people who only choose to go to London for their things and stuff like that. So uh, actually quite, uh, I'm a part of a lot of stuff here now. Um, I've been working. So we did a hackathon last year, MK Hackathon. That detracted loads of people. We did it for the good of Milton Keynes. We're doing another one this year with some uh, video tagging stuff. So that's going to be so cool. Do you want to um, tell us a bit about that? What the um, what kind of projects people were submitting and who won that? Yeah. So we so essentially it was a it was a two day over a weekend. Um, and we because uh, it was the first one, we wanted to come up with an idea to get people uh, sort of interested first rather than just having it as a sort of free day come up with it while you're while you're here um so we did um we worked with a couple of local places uh mk smart and community action mk who'd done surveys on basically what people were unhappy with in milton Keynes. um and i don't know if you know uh there's like redways everywhere so we're a complete grid system with roundabouts at every grid point and along near enough every road is a redway Um, sorry what's a redway so a redway is like um it's like an extra smooth red path so it's like a sidewalk um but it's but it's uh, smooth so that you can bike on it ah uh. Yeah, so the deliberate purpose of it is so that rather than driving around Mount Keynes, you could just literally take a bike and probably go anywhere because you probably only go up two grids and a bit left and you'd be there. Um, but actually, people are complaining about it a lot. You know, we don't know where to go. We don't know where's safe because Milton Keynes is one of those places where you can go to, like, you can be on one estate, so one section of Milton Keynes, and at opposite sides, there are completely different types of people. And one of them could be completely crime ridden, one of them could be million pound houses. And it's one of those weird places. So um parents were saying there wasn't they weren't sure where to take their kids. They they didn't have a way to like root themselves because at various points like there is no red way because you're a bit uh, you're on the outskirts sort of thing. And so where should you go and things like that. So we we took that on board and decided to do a redway routing app. Um, So that's what we built on the day. And we've got some funding from the OU over the course of the last uh, year to finish off. Is Milton Keynes a smart city? It will be. I don't know if it quite is yet, but yeah, (laughs) that that is what they're doing next. It was kind of a smart city of its time, I suppose. Yes, when it first started. And then I think um, it's very highly designed. Yeah, absolutely. And um, very business focused and um, trying to move up in the world. And I think it sort of took a halt, but they're they're putting in... Um, to, give Kate, I'm just listening. to give Kate a point of reference, imagine Canberra without the government. Very planned, very man-made. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like Canberra without the government. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although I would say that if you've visited Milton Keynes, then that's probably what you think, because the centre yeah, is very yeah, much yeah. like that, and it's like a it's a hub of things for you to do stuff in, and then go home on the train later, right? Um, but if you so where I live, I live um, up in Wolverton, which is north of Milton Keynes, and I can there's a canal 
two minute walk from my house and if i get to that canal i'm literally looking at fields so i mean it's both those things so it, it's a wonderful place to live you just need a car i think <laughs> that's probably the only thing um but you can you can do anything you want here that's uh, it's a really nice place to um find great people do lots of events because we have lots of things here it's very big um be part of a community but also feel like you're a big city at the same time i think it's a good balance yeah and i was also looking um i see you've done some work with um with an open university student association yes you want to tell us a bit about that yeah, that was wonderful. I mean, so um, and I mentioned in my sort of intro bit that I kind of believe that user experience can fit in anywhere, right? So, so for the for uh, for your cooking, for example, the user experience of a recipe is whether or not a person will be able to follow it or not, right? So, if you if you apply those principles to it, you can have a beautiful, beautifully written recipe that with with so little friction that someone can just do it and that's kind of where i'm at so so the point of the ou social media workshop was to teach um essentially they have reps um in various places because they were completely distance learning right so um they have reps in various places that can put on events and basically they try and bring students together even though they're distance learning so all of those people obviously need to use social media it's very important um, and part of it was just like kind of training them on it but the the way i did the workshop was to try and get them to think about the person the other end rather than what they wanted to say so a lot of social media is very you come from yourself right and you and you broadcast but if you don't think about the other side you you never make any success in it so um you know if i constantly tweeted about myself all day i'd get unfollows uh, you know constantly but if i provide something that's useful for people and um only post about interesting stuff rather than just um you know i walked to work today or you know <laughs> stuff like that if you think about that other side and why it would be useful to someone to try and help people out in that manner then then that's how you get success so that was what the social media workshop was about taking them through that journey and um getting them to come up with that thought themselves so i kind of i didn't present them with that as an option that was my intended conclusion and yeah, we got there sure. all eventually <laughs> um, yeah you will go this way you will <laughs> i will guide you <laughs> okay no, it was really good really Sounds very great. interesting uh, yeah. and the one final one Oh, hang on. Kate is gesturing at me. Yes. No? Okay. The, the one final <laughs> one I'd just like to quickly talk about because I love these kind of what something, what experience from somewhere can teach me about something else. This is something I've actually uh, a big fan of myself. I guess it's down the analogy path. But this, um, I think, I'm, I'm assuming, assuming your website is, is up to date. Uh, you're talking at the MK Lit Fest in September, unless it was last September. Just double check. No, it's this one coming. Um, yeah. <laughs> about how UX thinking is helping me to write a novel, um, which, and vice versa. Which I, I love this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I have lots of experiences that I think are useful to other people. It's always been something I've tried to do. I mean, so. No, no spoilers. Has it, <laughs> has it helped you? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this is along the similar vein of um, what I say. It, user experience is literally everywhere. And it, if you apply the principles of the empathy, you can fix literally every. This is, I feel so strongly about it. I mean, I use it in day to day. So, like, things like making a cup of tea. I will do it in the most user experience the popular way possible. That it just, I mean, rather than making the perfect cup of tea as a, you know, as a, you know, a tea society would say, I do it in the most efficient way because that is the least, um, the the method with the least friction for me. Stuff like that, you know, I I just apply it to everything. So, the the novel thing is really interesting because again, you have to think about the other person. So. I mean, I'm in this writers group and a lot of the people in there are kind of, they're very stuck in their own heads. So they might, I mean, they might, they have brilliant ideas. They're very clever people and they can definitely write, but sometimes they're too focused on what, either what they want to say about it or um, how they feel about it. And without that kind of, um, bit of research and the thought and um, always I mean it, it's like a self-reflection thing without always thinking back to the other side you you can't possibly make something that is going to be as popular as you'd like it to be so I mean you may have a great idea that is popular for you but is it popular for everybody else and you know it's those kind of things so I've been I've been kind of plotting it's a novel um for a while um and the more i get into the characters actually that's where it's helped me the most so when i think about how i so i have my view of who i like and what kind of people i like right and that's a very internal thing that everybody has but is that something that will make people read it like the characters feel the way i want them to feel about it and it's about switching your head to think the opposite way 
Yeah, and um, and vice versa. So the the writing of the novel has taught me loads of things about um, just stories in general. Yeah. So yeah, now sure. now when I'm designing, I'm thinking about okay, well, what's the what's the process now that people are actually looking through my stuff? Because um, so for example, I've been working remote with Manning for this live video, um, and sometimes showing the designs is actually really hard. I mean, it sounds like a silly thing, but showing things remotely and making sure that everybody understands the point you're going to get across. Sometimes we'll have a meeting where I talk through it. Sometimes we won't. So presenting those in the correct way and doing it in a story manner that takes people along my thought process has been a really um, important thing. So the more I the more I write stories and do that, bit, the the easier the design story gets. So the picture version of a story, you know. Okay, no, it's it's very valid. I've mm. been attempting to write some books too, and that free form structure is very hard. You need things to help you start and finish mm, yeah, <laughs> and make points in the middle excellent it's been very nice to talk to you just mm. in addition to the better web project in addition to moving to <laughs> holland to start a yeah. new job is there anything else you want to plug or mention uh no, not, <laughs> that no enough to not keep now. you busy yeah. i think you know i've got so many things going on and ideas coming out my brain that um uh, I think enough uh, pitching that is enough. I do have one more thing that <laughs> okay. I actually can't talk about, but um, Ooh, yeah, no all these things, but you're going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to do it a little bit. So um, I'm building a chatbot app that tells stories okay. that oh, involves yeah. the user. So I can't really say any more than that, but um, I'm going to build a prototype soon. So I'll oh. actually send it through to you guys. Actually, I, know I would possibly even be interested in collaborating on that. I had a similar idea. Maybe we'll talk about that another Amazing. time. Amazing. <laughs> um, okay. So you could stay in touch with Jessica on uh, jessicalovegood.co.uk. Uh, you'll have to change that to .nl soon. Yeah. Um, and on Twitter at lovegooddigital. Um I have been Chris. You can stay in touch with me at Chris Chinch on Twitter. And Kate, do your familiar oh, yes. random Twitter handle. <laughs> I've been Kate, and you can find me on Twitter. That's Kate with C underscore Lawrence with a W. <laughs> and you can find more about the podcast, previous episodes, and supporting the show on com slash podcast. Thanks again, Jessica. And, Thank and thanks you. for your Thank time. Thank you for having me. Thank no you. No worries. Take care. Thank you.